Yes, welcome everyone. Cannabis News. I'm your host, Joe Clare. It's October 25th, 2019. The show, as always, is presented to you by the Marijuana Times. MarijuanaTimes.org. Find us there. Click the video tab. A bunch of great articles from a lot of great writers as well. MarijuanaTimes.org. Today, we're talking about marijuana legalization and societal approval. Also, we're still talking about Elon Musk smoking a blunt on Joe Rogan's podcast all those many, many months ago. And we'll talk about Beth Chapman the uh, late wife of Dog the Bounty Hunter, and her relationship with cannabis in her final days. All of that is coming up. First, of course, Cannabis News is brought to you by NatureSide, nature-side.com. It's where you can find the organic, all-natural pesticides. Grow safe and poison-free. Don't use harmful chemicals or banned pesticides or yucky things on what you are growing. Use NatureSide, nature-side.com, a proud sponsor of Cannabis News. Thank you, NatureSide. They're awesome. Have I mentioned before that they're awesome? Well, if not, well, I'll mention it right now. They're awesome. Anyway, this first story is by yours truly. <laughs> am, I, am I bringing a broadcaster or what? Come on! From MarijuanaTimes.org. Marijuana legalization and societal approval. You can read this, of course, at MarijuanaTimes.org. It's linked in the description of this video. Basically... You all know I talk a lot on this show, as I mentioned in the article, about normalization and mainstreaming of marijuana and how that will help when it comes to the policy side of things and advancing legalization. But I don't want that to be confused with people thinking that I believe that society needs to put some sort of approval stamp on marijuana legalization before it should happen. No, I don't care who approves. I don't care if no one approves. As I've said many times, the point of legalization, the reason for legalization is the people who grow, sell, process, gift, possess, consume marijuana are not infringing on the rights of anyone else. Therefore, they are not criminals. That is the only reason for legalization. Everything else, social justice, jobs, economic activity, tax revenue, all ancillary side effects. Positive, sure, but side effects nonetheless. The main, the only reason to legalize marijuana is because people who are involved with marijuana are not infringing on the rights of anyone else. They're not committing a crime. So society doesn't need to prove of anything. I don't care what you think about marijuana. It should have no effect on someone else's criminality when using it or selling it or possessing it. But anyway, to get to my point, there was this article uh, in Arizona, ABC 15 in Arizona. They quote Stacy Pearson, who's a spokesman for the Arizona Dispensary Association. They're talking about adult use legalization attempts, trying to get on the ballot next year in Arizona. For, uh, 2020 to legalize adult use marijuana. Here's what she said about her group's um, measure that they want to put forward. Our policy is truly the best policy for Arizona. The Arizona voter does not want dispensaries on every street corner like a Kmart. They don't want marijuana being sold at every convenience store like they, they walk into. Many of them are okay with recreational marijuana as long as it's out of sight, out of mind. Okay, a few problems with this paragraph. One, there was never a Kmart on every corner. I hate the on every corner comparison. There's nothing on every corner, not even living domiciles. Nothing is on every corner. Yes, you can say, oh, well, it's, it's a turn of phrase. It's a, it's, a, it's a euphemism, whatever. No, it's not. Nothing has ever been anywhere near approaching on every corner. Nothing. No product can sustain that. No store can sustain that. No single thing can sustain a location on every corner, not even close. At the height of Kmart, where I live, there was maybe three in a 15-mile radius. That's about it. Same with Walmart, same with Target, same with anything else you want. That was an excessive amount of speedways and subways, but even then, it's like five or six within a 10-mile radius. It's not a lot. So let's forget that. She says uh, they don't want a marijuana being sold at every convenience store. What poll does she get that from? Where does she get that from? Where does that information come from? It's anecdotal, obviously. But as I point out in the article, let's say they did do a poll. They talked to every single possible voter in Arizona and asked them, do you want a marijuana in every convenience store? Do you want marijuana restricted, out of sight, out of mind, whatever you want to call it? Even if 78% of them said, yes, I want it out of sight, out of mind, my question is, so what? Who cares what they want? Since when do we poll at the ballot box about what convenience stores should have in their shelves? The case can be made slightly for alcohol in some jurisdictions, dry counties, whatnot, but for the most part, it's not even close. We already vote for what's in stores. It's called buying it or not buying it. We vote with our money every single day, but they don't want to do that. 
These people don't want to do that. They don't like marijuana, so they want it out of the way. They don't want to see it. My question again, so what? So what? If you don't want to walk past a, a, a sample case of marijuana on your way to get a 12-pack of Bud Light, well, that's too bad. It's too bad. I think I suspect you'll survive. You'll be fine walking by a glass case that has marijuana in it. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to jump out and get you. You might bump into it. That may be a problem. Maybe have sharp corners. Maybe they should pad the corners for the little babies who can't handle seeing marijuana in a store. I don't care what you think about marijuana. If a convenience store wants to sell marijuana, they should be able to sell it. I don't give a rat's patoot, pardon my French, what you think or what you approve of or what you want to see sold in a convenience store. I don't care. You don't like what's sold in that convenience store, go to a different one. The thing about convenience stores is there is a lot of them. They're not on every corner quite, not even close, obviously. But if you want to take the aggregate amount of total convenience stores, gas stations and such, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of choices you can go to. Maybe a frequent one that doesn't sell marijuana if it bothers you so much. I don't care if Arizonans want marijuana out of sight, out of mind. Many of them are okay with recreational marijuana as long as it's out of sight and out of mind. How condescending, how arrogant, how narcissistic for anyone to think that way. Again, I don't know who these people are that she's talking about. If anyone thinks that, well, I'm fine with recreational marijuana. I just don't want to see it sold anywhere. I don't care. I don't care. I'm fine with recreational marijuana. I don't want to see your ugly face anywhere. Do I get to vote on that? No, because it's stupid. It's stupid. And so is this. That's stupid. I don't care what you think. I don't care if you approve. I don't care if you don't want to walk into your local speedway and see a, a bong rack. I don't care. Do you own the, that convenience store? If not, then shut up. That's who decides on this, what's on the shelves. It either sells or it don't. The bongs don't sell. Well, guess what? Guess what? The bong rack's gone. The weed don't sell. It's gone. But it will. And that's what they're worried about. They, don't want, they know it's going to sell. They know a lot of places will have it. And they don't like it. They don't like seeing the marijuana when they go into a store. Oh, boo. Oh. Let me get out my tiny violin for the people who don't like seeing marijuana. They don't like it in their eye line. It's not like the convenience store owner is shoving a bong in your face and making you puff it before you walk in. It's, be, it's for sale, like chips. It's like someone saying, man, there's too many barbecue chips in this convenience store. I don't want, I don't want to see that. I'm all for eating people eating barbecue chips, but I want it out of sight, out of mind. Shut up, you dummy. Speaking of more dumb stuff, how about this? We're still talking about this. NASA paid SpaceX for safety review after Musk smoked pot. You remember that, don't you, on the Joe Rogan podcast? It was a huge, huge, huge deal for a long, long time. Inexplicably, that he took a poor hit off of a blunt on the Joe Rogan podcast. Elon Musk did. We talked about it on this show. We talked about it. People talked about it everywhere. It was one of the biggest things that ever happened. People freaked. They freaked. Oh, the, the world's going to end. Astronauts are going to start falling out of the sky because Elon Musk, who clearly is not a regular cannabis user by virtue of what we saw on the Joe Rogan podcast, took a not inhaling hit from what it looked like to me and many other observers off of a blunt. He's like, mm, this, this is illegal? Yes. Huh. Mm, wow. It's not like he's, uh, you, you could tell he's not familiar with this at all. But, hey, guess what? His infam infamous pot smoking incident last year. Was that last year? Was that 2018 that that happened? Holy crap. Time is flying. Last year prompted NASA to order a mandatory review of the federal contractor's workplace culture. The taxpayers, not the company, after bearing the cost, are bearing the cost, according to contracting records reviewed by Politico. A lot of the stories about Boeing and SpaceX are both trying to build these shuttles for NASA. Uh, Boeing had to do a review as well after the, the Musk thing, as did uh, SpaceX, but NASA is reimbursing SpaceX $5 million for these tests. God. And <laughs> they're not reimbursing Boeing. So some people are Boeing like, well, hey, man, that's not cool. And SpaceX is all like, well, we pay this in our contract for these ancillary costs and so on and so forth. None of that matters. I don't care. What I care about is that they hit a $5 million review because Elon Musk smoked some weed poorly on the Joe Rogan podcast. Why? Why? One, either A, they, uh, they thought, they think that, well, because he was, he smoked a blunt on the podcast, that means that 
the employees are smoking weed or that the employees would see him on Joe Rogan and think it's open season on smoking weed at SpaceX and they're filling up the hangars where the shuttles are with uh, weed smoke and all the shuttle parts are going to be covered in like a, a, a light film of resin. This is ridiculous. $5 million to make sure that none of the people on S SpaceX are on weed because Elon Musk did a bad job of, uh, of smoking a blunt on a podcast. The decision, which has not previously been reported, struck some space industry insiders as a highly unusual expenditure given that Musk, who holds a security clearance, prompted the concerns about whether SpaceX is following the rules. Obviously, they say, you know, since Musk started this, they should be able to, that SpaceX should have to pay for it as well. And believe me, I'm not on board with $5 million being given to SpaceX of taxpayer money to make sure that they're not on weed because Elon Musk did inhale a blunt on a podcast. That's ridiculous. The whole thing is ridiculous. The fact that I'm talking about this apparently a year later is ridiculous. I want to be done with <laughs> Elon Musk not inhaling a blunt on a podcast. Can we move on? Can It's fine, right? None of the shuttles collapsed. Nobody's died. We're all okay, right? We don't have a SpaceX debris hurtling towards Earth that's going to kill many people. Correct? We're all we're good on that? All right. Let's move on then. Jesus Christ. Would he calm down? Even if he had... I can't think of anything he would have done. And during that podcast, I could have prompted a review of his entire co company. He said, uh, unless he would have said, you know, I'm... I mean, the mob are like this, Joe. We're, I mean, the mafia. What's left of the mafia? Oh, we're just doing it all with SpaceX. Then maybe that would prompt a review. Not him going... Oh, what's this? Oh, is this marijuana? Mm, cannabis. <laughs> oh, no. No. That's crazy. Yes, and that was my Elon Musk impression. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's the quality content you're here for. This last story is from SurvivorNet.com. Beth Chapman chooses cannabis over chemo and dogs most wanted. Quality of life and palliative care for incurable lung cancer. I'll talk about the second part of that headline here. In a second, a new episode of Dogs Most Wanted, we see the effects of a difficult decision that Dwayne the dog, the bounty hunter Chapman's wife, Beth Chapman, made toward the end of her life. The decision to stop treating her advanced lung cancer with chemotherapy and to turn instead to cannabis. Beth Chapman was 51 when she died of stage 4 lung cancer this past summer. In a new episode of Dogs Most Wanted, which was filmed when Beth was still living, viewers see a raw and transparent journey in the recent conversations with Survivor Net, both Dog Chapman and Bonnie Chapman, who is Dog and Beth's youngest daughter, said that the decision had a powerful effect on Beth's quality of life in her final months. The day we started the cannabis treatment, Beth hadn't eaten for nine days, Death, uh, Dog told Survivor Net. The next day, after two doses, she woke up in the morning and said, Honey, I'm hungry. In the new episode of Dog's Most Wanted, we also see Beth feeling well enough to go on a hike with her family and sharing positive results of cannabis. I definitely am able to eat if I stay on it and I can sleep, Beth says. If I don't take it, I'm awake. Um, then they talk about cannabis helping with tougher symptoms, uh, but it's not a cancer cure. The unfortunate reality, of course, is that Beth Chapman did ultimately die for her lung cancer from her lung cancer this past June. And while her family has spoken highly on the positive changes that uh, switching to cannabis had on Beth's quality of life, it's really important to note that it only helped the symptoms, not the underlying cause. Cannabis cannot treat cancer or stop it from spreading. Instead, it's part of what's called supportive or palliative care, meaning it helps to address some of the effects of cancer, not the cancer itself. Now, this is fair as far as it goes, but I will point out that even though there have been human clinical trials or anything approaching that level of scrutiny when it comes to cannabis and cancer, there are multiple studies that show that cannabinoids help with cancer cells. They help treat them. They help reduce the size. They help reduce the spreading of the cannabis, of the cancer cells, rather. Uh, so there is some, and Bob, obviously Rick Simpson, a, a cure, run from the cure, um, uh, anecdotal evidence shows that cannabis helps with cancer, but there's, like I said, not any full-scale full scale clinical trials or something along those lines. But there will be some day, and we're moving towards that. So to count out cannabis as a cancer cure so far, or as of yet, is a little premature. Hopefully we'll learn more as time goes on. That's going to do it for Cannabis News. It's Friday. It's the weekend. Go enjoy the weekend. Thank you to NatureSide, nature-side.com, and their organic all-natural pesticides. Thanks to all of you for watching and listening today. Keep spreading the truth about cannabis with this show, and we'll see you next time right here on Cannabis News. Cannabis News.